So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the DeFord Lecture Series. My name is Elizabeth Catlos and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. We're part of the Jackson School of Geosciences and the DeFord Lecture Series is our departmental seminar series. It's been a requirement and tradition for all graduate students since the late 1940s. The lecture series is named after Professor Ronald DeFord, who joined UT Austin as a professor in 1948 with the purpose of enhancing the quality of the graduate program in the department. Our lecture series is supported by a range of endowments, and today's speaker is the Judd H. and Cynthia S. Walling Centennial Lecturer in Geological Sciences. The series was established in 1983 to bring exceptional and distinguished lectures to the Jackson School for the benefit of the geosciences community. Um, the endowments honor Mr. Judd H. Walling of Houston, Texas. He's a 1942 geology graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and former vice president and general manager of Getty Oil Company's Southern Exploration and Production Division. He was a member of both the Western Oil and Gas Association and the Illinois Oil and Gas Association. The lectureship was established to meet the then need, critical need for funding outside speakers. Mr. Walling was instrumental in securing the Getty Oil Company chair, the first company sponsored chair within the Geology Foundation of the school, which is currently held by Dr. Mark Poos within the Department of Ge Geological Sciences. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel. You can do this at any time. The chat has been disabled. Um, and we will bring up those questions and answers, uh, the questions after the talk. Um, the recording of the talk will be posted on the DeFord website, and we'd like to encourage you to share it with your social networks. Our speaker will be introduced formally by Dr. Liang Yang, who is the professor, who is a professor, who's a professor in the Department of Geological Sciences, as well as the John A. and Catherine G. Jackson Chair in Earth System Sciences, and he holds the Dave P. Carlton Centennial Professorship in Geology. Liang, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee Carlos. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, Soya. Uh, actually, this is a main night in Switzerland. Um, it's a, my great honor to introduce today's speaker, renowned climate scientist, Dr. Sonia C. Ravitney. Uh, Sonia is a professor at the Institute for Atmospheric and Climate Science of uh, ETH Zurich. She specializes in climate extremes, land climate interactions, and climate change. Professor Sonia Sinivratni was an author over several reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. Since 2018, she is a coordinating lead author of the sixth assessment report of IPCC. She has received numerous awards for her pioneer work, uh, influential work. Among them are uh, James Maslow Medal from American Geophysical Union, AGU, in 2013, and a grant from European Research Council, Consolidated Grant, 2014 to 2019, and the Proof of Concept Grant, 2021 to 2022. She was also elected an AGU Fellow in 2013. She's listed among the highly cited researchers of a web of science. We thank Sonia for accepting our invitation to give this talk Actually, in the past three years in a row, we have been um, inviting her to visit us, give a talk. Unfortunately, um, um, because of her busy schedule and the other uh, things, so um, we did not have that uh, to uh, realize. Uh, now we have her, but now this is in a Zoom uh, virtual uh, meeting. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome um, Dr. Sonia Sventonin, and I'm, I'm going to hand this over to Sonia. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Liang, for the kind uh, introduction and, uh, and the invitation, and also to, to Liz as well for the invitation. Uh, and as you said, uh, I really appreciate that uh, you met me a few years ago. And actually, I, I was pr first planning to come in person, uh, actually, this year also in May. And of course, now because of COVID, it's uh, remote. Uh, so I'm going to share uh, my screen. Um, 
and maybe let me know if anything is not looking fine. Okay, yeah, so it's a great pleasure to give uh, this presentation. I will uh, give a presentation on climate change and extreme events, uh, and I want to show you why every year matters. Um, I should say maybe I give this presentation now from Switzerland, so it's a bit late at night, but I hope I, I will be awake all the time. <laughs> so um, I'll present mainly some, um, some conclusions of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree uh, warming. And so I want to start by a short, uh, with a short introduction on the report. And then I will show how we can relate changes in global warming to regional changes in climate extremes and impacts. Uh, then I will address one main topic of the IPCC uh, special report, which is on climate changes at 1.5 degree versus two degree and the extent to which half a degree Celsius matters. So about one degree Fahrenheit. Then I will discuss the role of land processes for temperature projections. Uh, and I will present uh, what are emission scenarios that could allow us to stabilize global warming to uh, plus 1.5 degree. And I will finish with a few uh, conclusions. Um, so the special report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, on uh, 1.5 global warming was published uh, in October 2018. It was a very uh, special report from IPCC. There are often a larger report which are written, but this report was a short report which had been actually asked by the different uh, governments as part of the Paris Agreement. And the main purpose of this report was to inform on the impact and the relevance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees, which are the two uh, temperature levels mentioned in the Paris Agreement. So an overview of the report in a few numbers. There were 91 authors that contributed from 40 countries. Um, there were 133 uh, contributing authors, about 6,000 studies that were cited, uh, more than 1,000 reviewers and 42,000 comments. I was one of the lead authors um, and working on this report. I worked on this uh, chapter, chapter three, which looked at the impacts of 1.5 degree global warming on natural and human systems. And to give a background on the, the report again, and to put it in the context of the Paris Agreement, the, one of the main um, decision of the Paris Agreement, uh, which was signed by uh, most countries of the world, uh, is to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And so one main question, so you have this range, is whether it makes any difference to really aim towards 1.5 degrees versus two degrees. That was one of the main questions of this report. So I'm going to start with a few uh, results regarding where we are now and what do we know. That's, uh, since that was for 2018. So since pre-industrial time, human activities have caused approximately one degree of global warming. In the meantime, we are closer to 1.1 degree of global warming, but of course there is still a bit uh, of, of time before we would reach 1.5 degree. Uh, but even for one degree of global warming, we are seeing consequences for people, nature, and livelihoods. And at the current rate of warming, not including the COVID-19 uh, period, because now we have had a little bit less increase in emissions this year, uh, but the rate of warming we have had in recent years, uh, we would reach 1.5 degree between 2030 and 2052. But what is really important to realize is that past emissions alone do not commit the world to 1.5 degree. So once we emit CO2, uh, this accumulates in the atmosphere and leads to a warming that is not really reversible. But if we stop emitting, basically we can stabilize temperature. That's a really important fact. So how can we relate changes in global warming to regional climate extremes and impacts? Um, the first point about why we are interested in global warming is that uh, global warming is a good measure to relate to uh, CO2 emissions. So it's a good measure of uh, climate change. And there is actually a direct link between cumulative CO2 emissions and the climate response. Uh, 
So this is a figure from the last large IPCC report that was published in 2013. As mentioned, the newest one is being uh, written at the moment. I'm also contributing to it. So this figure from the last big uh, IPCC report showed uh, how the mean global warming here on the y-axis is related to the cumulative total CO2 emission of human origins, so our emissions. Now what you see is that uh, there is some range. This is from all the available models, but the lines here are for the multi-model mean and for different uh, emission scenarios. And what you see is that relationship is almost linear, which means that you can relate the total emissions we have had and the additional emissions we might have in the future directly to a given level of global warming. So we can have a direct relationship between how much CO2 is emitted and the resulting global warming. In black, you see the observation at the time that uh, went to at about 2010. Um, and basically, uh, these were uh, based on, on uh, projections. So we are now at a bit above one degree. And we see that we have very little available emissions before we reach uh, 1.5. And if we want to keep uh, beyond uh, below two degrees and it gives us a bit more possibility for emissions, but at some point emissions need to be zero because as long as we are emitting more CO2 then global warming is increasing. What are the implications of this global warming for regional climate extremes? Can we relate this change in mean global temperature to the regional responses? Um, these are some uh, figures from the IPCC special report, which is showing um, changes in temperature extremes at 1.5 degree of global warming. Uh, on the left, you see here changes in the hot days of the year. On the right, the temperature of the coldest uh, night of the year. Um, what you see clearly uh, is that there is a gradient of warming. Uh, obviously, all what I'm showing is in degrees Celsius, so in Fahrenheit, it would be about twice uh, larger, larger. But what you see is you have this stronger warming of the land. So at 1.5 degree, you don't have a 1.5 degree anomaly everywhere. In reality, um, you have much higher warming of the land. So for instance, here in many regions, we are rather between two and three degrees. So in some location, it can be about twice larger for the hottest day of the year. And for the coldest nights, the factor can be up to three times larger. So we see here right about 4.5 degree uh, increase, which obviously is very large. And that's why we have also very high uh, temperature anomalies in the high latitudes. So we have the stronger warming of land extremes compared to global temperature. And this is due to a range uh, of processes among other uh, some moisture feedbacks, but also snow feedbacks in high latitudes. So how can we relate now the regional extremes uh, to global warming? In fact, we find that there is a relatively uh, almost linear relationship of the multimodal mean compared to global warming. So if you are looking here at a change in the warmest day of the year uh, in the Mediterranean, this is a change in this uh, temperature. And here you have global warming. These are simulations uh, available uh, either for emissions scenarios where you have very large emissions so they go up to about uh, 4.5 degree of global warming and some scenarios that have less emissions here but interestingly you see independent of the scenario you're considering the relationship is almost the same so you know that if you manage to limit global warming to two degree for instance you would be at around uh, a bit above three degree and if you actually manage to limit it to 1.5, you would have substantially less warming. So you can relate this response in global warming to the regional response in extremes. So we find that there is a stronger warming of extremes in land hotspots uh, compared to uh, global temperature. We have seen this also in the global maps. And there is this uh, robust and almost linear scaling that we find for the multimodal mean mostly independent of emission scenarios. In, in pink here, you see the total model range. I should say in some regions, this range is larger and I will show this later on. We find also a rather good scaling for the warming of the minimum temperature and change in heavy precipitation. So here you see the warming of the, in the Arctic region 
uh, that's for the coldest uh, night. And here actually the scaling is much larger. So as mentioned before, the warming is about three times larger than global warming. And so uh, at two degree, you have about six degree of warming. And of course at 1.5, about 4.5 degree. For heavy precipitation, this uh, are projected changes for South, South and Asia, uh, for the heaviest five day precipitation. And we find also for the multimodal means or those lines that there is more or less a linear relationship, but there the uncertainty are much larger. So here if we see a strong uh, model dependency. Uh, so at two degree, you could have little uh, increase. And in some models, you have actually very large increase, more than 30%. So we see, for instance, for heavy precipitation, there is more uncertainty. And some scenarios suggest that you could have much uh, stronger increase. So now we come to the question of whether half a degree matters. Uh, if we are look, comparing the changes in those extremes at 1.5 degree versus two degree. And here I wanted to just mention uh, recent extreme events, uh, which all of them actually we know were made more probable by human induced climate change. Uh, so there were, there was for instance, a tropical cyclone Harvey, uh, the trop tropical cyclone itself, its um, probability of occurrence is not affected by climate change, but the heavy precipitation associated with a tropical cyclone, uh, we know is uh, uh, basically made uh, stronger because of global warming. Uh, there were also hot extremes in the summer of 2018 uh, in much of the uh, northern uh, latitudes. Uh, for instance, in Europe, also in North America, in, in Japan, many people died there. Uh, there was also a strong heat wave in uh, Europe and the drought in part. Um, and uh, there were actually several events now that were uh, related to, to fires. For instance, fires in uh, California in 2018, 2020. Also strong, very hot temperatures and then associated fires in Australia in uh, between December 2019 and January 2020, and then again a very strong heat wave in Siberia. Now for the fires, I will show that there are also recent evidence of IPCC showing that there are probabilities increase with uh, global warming, uh, but also the fact that fires depend on both hot temperatures and dry conditions. Dry conditions are more dependent on internal variability, but we know that the hot temperatures are clearly a sign of global warming and made uh, more probable with global warming. So what are the differences in climate extremes uh, between uh, climates at 1.5 degree versus 2 degree of, clo of uh, global warming? Well, we find that there is a substantial difference for the hottest days. So um, there is clearly a difference in temperature of the hottest day, as you can see here. Uh, the cross uh, hatching here is showing why we have two thirds of model agreement. So there is clear uh, model agreement almost everywhere about this. And uh, for instance, if you're looking at the change in the number of hot days, you see a very strong and clear signal all over the continents. So we find a substantial and robust increase in temperature extremes in all regions at two degrees versus 1.5 degrees. So certainly for hot extremes, it does make a substantial difference. If you are looking at the changes uh, in uh, heavy precipitation, we find that there is less uh, local uh, model agreement, but there is a general agreement that most regions show uh, a tendency towards increase. And if you average the signals over some uh, regions, so for instance, if you're interested in Central North America, uh, you find that many uh, heavy precipitation indices show an increase that can be statistically, that is statistically significant. So there is a robust tendency towards increase in heavy precipitation at two degrees versus 1.5, which are significant in several large regions. So if you have region over larger regions, you find they are significant in many locations, in particular in uh, North America. Regarding uh, droughts and water availability, this is more uncertain because there is more uh, intermodal uh, range. Uh, but what we find for the multimodal median here is that certainly some regions show a tendency uh, towards drying. So if you're looking at precipitation minus evapotranspiration, it includes a uh, part here uh, of, uh, of Texas. Uh, 
But I think maybe the more important message is that there is still uncertainty because different models show different results. But you find that 10% of the models, for instance, project a very strong drying over much of the land areas. On the other hand, you have some wet models that don't show any drying. So again, this is more uncertainty. So what are impacts at 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees? And uh, how can we basically summarize those main effects between those two levels of global warming? This is a synthesis that was done in the uh, report. And uh, there are so-called reasons for concerns, uh, which are synthesized. One is uh, on impacts on unique and threatened systems. Second is extreme weather events. Uh, third one is distribution of impacts. Fourth one is a global aggregate of impacts. Final one is the large case relevance, so which is related to tipping points. So for many of those um, systems, basically, you find that at the moment, so at one degree or slightly above one degree, we have more or less moderate risks. That's what is shown here in yellow. And you see that at 1.5 degree, in many cases, we already shift to about high risk. So in red shading, um, this is not the case for, for all, uh, but certainly for instance here for the unique and threatened systems. And you find for many of them, you, there is a substantial difference between 1.5 and 2 degree because for instance, for the unique and threatened system, you shift from high risk to very high risk. And very high risk means that um, you start to have irreversible impacts. To go a little bit in more details, these are some impacts and risks for selected natural managed and human system. So some systems are particularly at risk as a cause. They're actually already at risk now. They're already in the high risk uh, category at uh, the present level of warming. And we know there have been several uh, mass events of bleaching that occurred, and we would be at very high risk already at 1.5. But of course, it would be even worse than 2 degree. You see also that there are some systems that uh, have uh, substantial change, for instance, also coastal flooding, which can be relevant for Texas. There is uh, about high risk at 1.5 degree and very high risk above, slightly above 2 degree. So what are the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degree? Uh, if we manage to limit global warming to 1.5 compared to 2, which of course would still be worse than today, we would less, have less extreme events where people live, including extreme heat and rainfall. We would also have 10 million fewer people exposed to risk of rising seas because sea level is increasing with higher warming. And we would avoid some irreversible changes like loss of coral reefs, sea level rise, and some loss of uh, terrestrial species. I also want to show some uh, new evidence that came after the IPCC special report on 1.5 uh, degrees. These are results from conclusions from the IPCC special report on land, which was published uh, last summer in 2019. And this is also providing the same type of ember diagrams, it's assessment of risk for wildfire damage and food supply instabilities. And if anything, I would say those assessments show even more how uh, relevant and important it is to limit global warming, if possible, to 1.5 degree. So if you're looking at uh, wildfire, you see that at the present level of warming, we're in the range of moderate risk. And we know that even with moderate risk, we are having already several events that were uh, quite uh, strong and had major impact. Uh, at 1.5 degrees, the report has said that we would switch to high risk. And you see that, well, it would be about the same at, at 2 degrees, but obviously the risk would be increasing above that. In terms of uh, food supply and instabilities, that's also an important point. And here, uh, the changes are quite nonlinear, they increase quickly. And the question there is also what is the risk of having disruptions of food production in several regions at the same time, which is also called compound events. And at the moment, the risks are not so high, they are moderate. But at 1.5 degree, we would also switch to uh, high risk. So the report shows that there would be risk of periodic food shocks across regions. In about two degrees, uh, we would, could have a uh, much higher risk, which is assessed as very high. If we were to do nothing and continue to emit 
uh, without mitigation, we could reach full degree and have sustained food supply disruptions globally. So I come now to the role of land processes for temperature projections this is a specific uh, topic on which I'm working and uh, young as well. And so I want to discuss uh, what is the impact of land processes for uh, changes in climate extremes. And for this, I want to focus on two regions where we have uh, a bit more complex responses of temperature extremes. Going uh, to focus on the contiguous uh, US here and on Central Europe. What you see, uh, that's for the contiguous US, we are again looking at the hottest uh, day of the year. Um, it's the same display I was showing before. So you have the change in global mean temperature here and the change in those hot extremes on the y-axis. And the lines are showing again the multimodal mean. Uh, what you see is that uh, again the multimodal mean is more or less depending linearly on the global warming. But the total model range here is much larger for temperature extremes. So we have some models for which the warming is actually still limited. And I should say some simulation because it also reflects the internal climate variability and some as a simulation where it's reach about four degree of warming at two degrees. So we have uh, twice higher warming. For Central Europe, it's even uh, stronger. So for instance, two degree, we have um, a range between about one degree of warming regionally to six degrees, which of course would be uh, very high. So interestingly, those regions with very large spread, which means that we have substantial variability, but also substantial intermodal spread, so model uncertainty, are found in regions that we, where we know that there are large soil moisture temperature feedbacks. And here I've cited two papers on which uh, we have discussed and shown those uh, feedbacks. So regarding the role of sound moisture temperature feedbacks, I will say a few words about this. So obviously we have high temperature, uh, for instance, because of changes in radiation and so on. But on land, we have an additional process that can affect the uh, temperature and that changes in the energy balance. So switch between latent heat flux and sensible heat flux. So for instance, and in the context of uh, climate change, so if you have more greenhouse gases uh, and you have a wet soil, a lot of the energy is going to be used for evapotranspiration, so latent heat flux. This means it's going to lead to more uh, water input to the atmosphere, but in terms of temperature, there won't be a lot of impact. Now, if you're in a region which is getting drier, you cannot have any increase in evapotranspiration, and as a result, the effect will be rather an increase in the sensible heat flux, so much larger increase in temperature, because in addition to the original effect on temperature, you are going to have an added uh, warming through the increase in sensible heat flux. And I have listed here a number of papers which discuss those feedbacks. Uh, here, this is a figure from a more recent paper from uh, one of my former PhD students, Marta Vogel, which is showing that the, the feedbacks are even a bit more complex than what I was showing before. So there is this direct effect of sensible heat flux, but there is really like three feedback loops which are relevant. And as an additional one goes through the radiation also, because if you have drier conditions, you're going to have uh, less cloud cover and then more incoming short wave. Uh, and in addition, you can also have a positive feedback with precipitation, which in the case of uh, dryness means that you would have, again, less cloud cover and also less rain which leads to further drying. So you have three feedbacks that leads to uh, an amplification in the end of warming and of drying. So we have some observation uh, evidence that shows uh, this uh, strong connection between dry soils and hot temperatures. Um, this is showing the correlation between the number of hot days in, the, uh, in different regions in the three warmest months at each location. and the uh, conditions in the three preceding months, so how much precipitation is available. And you see that in many locations, the uh, correlation is negative, that's shown in red shading, and while you have uh, this hatching, it means it's uh, statistically significant. Uh, and actually, I've highlighted here at Texas because I originally we did this study with Brigitte Muller, also a former PhD student. It was for Texas, we were interested in uh, 
eight wave that happened in Texas uh, in 2011. And you see that actually in Texas, this uh, correlation is, is quite strong. So these are, are uh, from the data in Texas, the relationship between the number of hot days here and uh, precipitation deficits, the standardized precipitation index. When it's more negative, it means you have less precipitation. And here we are uh, displaying a quantile regression. What you see is that when you have a very high number of hot days, like in 2011, that was a heat wave, uh, you actually had very low precipitation. Um, and you don't really have any cases with a very high number of heat waves, heat days where you don't have low precipitation in the preceding months. So this shows that there is a kind of uh, preconditioning. So if you have several months with little precipitation, it will increase the probability of ending hot days and hot temperatures. So we also looked at this in uh, climate uh, projections. Uh, in the glassy semi 5 experiment, that's an experiment we did uh, with several uh, global modeling groups. And the first PSS were published in 2013, but there have been still uh, f several uh, recent papers using this simulation. And the simulation of uh, the following setup, it was inspired from experiments that were done by uh, Randy Koster at NASA, with whom I've also been working in the past. And so the simulation uh, is basically uh, designed to look at the effect of sun moisture uh, in the climate system. And so uh, if you take here the change in sun moisture over time, you see that it's a location where we have a mean dry. And then we have two more experiments, one where we remove the interannual variability in sun moisture, that is SM trend simulation. And we have one simulation in red, where we basically just remove all of the drying. Sun moisture stays the same, same as it was in the 20th century. And this allows us to look at the impact of the mean drying, the projections for projected changes, for instance, in temperature or other variables. And what we found was that in terms of uh, effects on temperatures, there are substantial effects. These are also further analyses that were done by Martha Vogel. And uh, if you're looking at a change in the temperature extremes, so again, the hottest day of the year, this is a control simulation where you find a large number of hotspots. Uh, we have seen this in the first figure. So we have several locations where we have a very strong increase in hot extremes. And interestingly, if you have a simulation like this SM26 simulation where so much is maintained as a level of the 20th century, those hotspots disappear. So we see that much of the projected warming, uh, additional warming in those regions and this includes also Texas and other parts of the US uh, is uh, basically in, induced by this thermal feedback. This is also clear if you do the same uh, scaling plots that uh, we were looking at before, this for Central Europe and that Central North America. In red, you have the control simulation, again showing in black, that would be the one one line, so it's showing the change in the hot extremes here. So hottest day of the year is function of global warming. You have this additional warming compared to global warming. But if you take the simulation where we prescribe some moisture to the condition of the 20th century, we see we are back on the one one line. So this additional warming has disappeared. So we see that some moisture temperature feedbacks are the main driver for the projected temperature extreme amplification in mid latitudes. Now that we have seen that land surface processes play an important role, for changes in extremes, of course, some other processes that are happening in, on land beyond, for instance, water conditions can, of course, be very relevant, like uh, land use changes and specifically biophysical effects of land use changes. Just to show this, uh, you could have differences in albedo, for instance, if you have not yet farming, uh, but of course, you have, can have uh, deforestation or change in albedo here between forest and non forest area. Plus, of course, in agricultural regions, also you can have uh, irrigation. So, because uh, those regional land conditions substantially affect temperature extremes, these biophysical effects of land use change are highly relevant. And often in the literature, it's rather the CO2 effects that are focused on. And those biophysical effects are generally not integrated in development of emissions scenario, but they could be relevant for regional changes in climate. Just to give one example, as a uh, study from Wim Thierry, who was uh, doing a postdoc in our group, 
and he looked at uh, what is the impact of present irrigation on temperature extremes. Uh, irrigation is not included in the models, but we find that the likely effect on temperature extremes is of the order of about uh, one degree in many regions. So we, we have a cooling of one degree because of irrigation in reality, but this effect is not included in the simulation. So it might have masked some of the warming uh, in, in the real world. On the other hand, of course, this might mean that in future climate, we may have more warming than what we have observed before. And then I just wanted to mention briefly uh, compound events, which is a topic on which uh, I've done some work recently, especially uh, with Jakob Schachler, who is, uh, le uh, is leading also a project on this topic in Europe. And the fact that you have these feedbacks between, for instance, drought and heat wave means that they are more likely to happen uh, concomitantly. Uh, and this means that uh, you, you have more probability of having both heat waves and droughts. And this uh, probability is increased more than what you would expect by chance. Um, this means that you need to also design some new frameworks for assessing the risk of uh, joint probability of uh, multiple extremes and go beyond the analysis of a new variety extreme that can be, for instance, relevant for fire risk. So now I want to finish with the emission scenario towards stabilization at 1.5 degree. What can we do to stabilize temperature at 1.5 degrees since we have seen that it would make substantial difference in terms of extremes and impacts. So these are the scenarios from the 1.5 degree report from IPCC. Um, and you see here uh, that total CO2 emissions in billion ton of CO2 per year. That's uh, the present level we were uh, at uh, in 2018 and still are more or less in 2020. And uh, the scenarios and uh, look at what could be achieved beyond 2020. So it's really starting from now on. And the scenarios that are consistent with uh, limitation of global warming to 1.5 with no limited overshoot, which means that you don't go much beyond 1.5 before stabilizing as also simulation shown here in blue. And on average, these uh, scenarios uh, reach net zero CO2 in about 2050. Now, maybe I have to explain what is net zero CO2 means. So as I mentioned before, because uh, CO2 is accumulating in the air and it stays there several hundreds to several thousands of years, it means that any warming is not reversible. So Again, if you want to stabilize temperature at some point, you have really to stop any emission, else it's still going to, to warm further. We should say that uh, that's the average, the 2050, that's the average uh, year for those uh, scenarios. But if you wanted to be on the safe side, so you wanted to be absolutely sure to manage to limit global warming to 1.5, you should rather choose 2040. Um, this would mean, because we are at about uh, 40 billion tons of CO2 uh, emissions per year, that would mean that more or less a 5% uh, decrease in emission every year, uh, which is more or less what we experienced in, uh, during this year, in 2020. Uh, so we didn't have a large amount of decrease, but we will need to have the same order of magnitude of decrease every year. But obviously, this would be better achieved through energy transition. We don't need to have the extreme conditions we have had in this year. Another important point is, uh, you see, after the stabilization, for after, after reaching net zero, you have still uh, actually some negative emissions. Uh, that's because CO2 still needs to be taken from the air. So to some extent, we're already too late because we need to uh, still take up further CO2 if we want to make sure uh, that we can stabilize temperature. And this is of the order of about 10% uh, of the emissions we have at the moment. Uh, the way this can be achieved uh, in the models uh, is, uh, is a risk carbon capture and storage combined with intense bioenergy, like crops and wood uh, use, and possibly also afforestation. And I will say a few words just about this now. So how could we possibly take CO2 from the air? Um, as mentioned, the scenarios include uh, in part afforestation or bioenergy use with carbon capture and storage. 
to me, it's really important to say, of course, this needs to be uh, considered and we need to look at to the extent to which this can help, but it's not a panacea, it's not going to be a perfect solution. Um, as I said, it's of the order of about 10% of present day emissions, which means that we need at least to remove 90% of our emissions, as they are. And on the other hand, one thing that is not considered in the integrated assessment models that are uh, developing those scenarios is effect of extremes. So we have seen, for instance, just now, that's a picture from Siberia. We have had intense fires, and these uh, risks are not taken into account. So if you were to do a lot of afforestation, and for instance, you had more fires, this could uh, endanger really this uh, type of scenario. So I think that's one point that we need to keep in mind. So again, this is important, of course, to analyze, but it's not a perfect solution. And just to show this further, uh, the scenarios that are uh, developed to, 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 uh, to assess the possibility to stabilize temperature, some of them include substantial change in land use, not all of them, but for instance, if you look at those simulations here, you see some sub, uh, substantial afforestation. So again, they should be carefully evaluated. Maybe a last concern I want to mention, this is from a study from Vincent Freer, also a former PhD student in, in our group. Uh, this is actually a process that we found is not very well represented in climate models. Uh, this is an analysis here is only based on observation. We looked at uh, variability in terrestrial water storage measured from GRACE data, that's a satellite measuring water storage on continents. And here you have the change in CO2 growth rates, so how much, by how much is CO2 increasing in the atmosphere. And interestingly, you find a direct relationship between the two, although the data itself is not related. And so whenever you tend to have, on average, drier conditions on land, you need to have, you tend to have much higher increase in CO2 in the air. And of course, uh, there are several conditions that would explain this. So if you have more drought, plants can take up less CO2, of course, and also if you have more drought, uh, you might have more fires, which release some CO2. So we have a strong observational evidence for this uh, relationship. Um, and I don't have time to show this in detail, but if you are, of course, this could uh, imply enhancing feedback in future climates. So because in some regions, we do find that there is more risk of drought. Um, and so if this is the case, it could lead to more CO2 release or at least less CO2 approach. But what we find is this relationship is underestimated in models. It's only about half of this correlation that we find in climate models. So I come to the conclusions. Um, half a degree matters. So we found that uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degree would avoid widespread increase in extremes. Uh, in hot extreme, but also heavy precipitation in several regions and drought in some regions. Uh, and again, this is, is uh, in Celsius, so it's about one degree Fahrenheit. So it's not a lot, but it does matter substantially. And we already experienced this important impacts of global warming at about one degree of global warming. As also mentioned in my title, every year matters because if we need to decrease our CO2 emissions by an additional 5% every year for 20 years. Any delay, of course, makes this more difficult to achieve the, the goal of reaching uh, net zero CO2 as quickly as possible. So if we wait any longer, we lose any chance of stabilizing temperature at 1.5 degrees, let alone 2 degrees. I should say Texas is at the forefront of climate impacts. Uh, we have seen it's affected by heat waves. Also, potential drought is one of the regions where we see on, that on, on average, the models show drying and also heavy precipitation with tropical cyclones and sea level rise. So climate change to me is the biggest challenge of our times. We really need to tackle it and we cannot wait any longer. I'll skip this one and I just want to finish with a few words from IPCC, which is uh, every action matters, every bit of warm warming matters, every year matters, and every choice matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. This is a great talk and uh, thank you for answering all the uh, good questions. Um, it's getting Thank late you. on your side. Uh, let's give, um, uh, I don't know, virtually. Uh, I know, uh, you're virtual. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was great to, to, to uh, give this talk and uh, I look forward to speaking with uh, more people tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for you. coming. Thank you. Thanks our audience who stuck around. Thank you all for coming and, and catch us next Thursday for the next DeFord lecture.